thank you for being here, John. Uh, thank you so much. Thanks for having me, Dave. I appreciate Woo! it. How's everyone doing? Hey. hey, John. It is so great to be with y'all. This is so fun. This is so fun. This is a first for me. I've never done any, anything like this. Can everyone hear me okay? Give me a thumbs up if you can hear me okay. Give me a thumbs up in the chat. Excellent. Okay. Action. All right. I love it. I love all the thumbs up. All right. So I'm going to talk about today the number one predictor and factor of success. And I would love for you to share what you think it is in the chat. What do you think the number one predictor and factor of success is? Action and habits and mindset, consistency. Wow, everyone sharing a lot of great stuff. I love it. I don't see the word that I'm looking for. It's one word. It begins with a G. It, it begins with a G. That's the little hint there. Not goals. Not great. It's grit. There we go. Grit. So the number one predictor and factor of success is grit. It's not ta talent. It's not title. It's not wealth. It's not good looks. It's grit. The ability to work hard for a long period of time, to overcome, to persevere, to keep moving forward in the face of failure, rejection, adversity, and obstacles. And one thing I know is that grit drives us. But if grit drives us, what drives grit? And that's what I want to talk about today. I want to share with you a formula of what drives grit. And the power of positivity is part of that formula, but there are other ingredients as well. And first and foremost, it starts with, it is inspired by vision and purpose. Where do you want to go? What is your vision? Because if you can see it, you can create it. If you have a vision, you also have the power to make it happen. Everything starts with a vision. I had a vision a number of years ago to, to write and speak. And my vision was to encourage and inspire as many people as possible one person at a time. And so when I wrote The Energy Bus, it was rejected by over 30 publishers. I was told to give up. It's not going to happen. But I couldn't give up because I had this vision. So I kept on hoping. I kept on dreaming. I kept on believing. I, I kept on praying. Finally, John Wally and Sons agreed to publish the book. I was so excited. It was coming out. I'll never forget. I asked a friend, what should I do? He said, pray. <laughs> so I, I, prayed, I prayed for it to be a bestseller. It came out. It was a bestseller in Korea. I learned you have to be specific with your prayers. It was like this huge hit in South Korea, not North Korea, but a huge success in South Korea, but not one bookstore in the United States would carry the book. So I decided to go on a 20 city tour paid for by myself. And I went from city to city sharing the message of the book. We had five people on one side. We had 10 people on another. We had 20 people on The most people we had were 100 people in Des Moines, Iowa. They thought Jeff Gordon was coming. That's why they showed up. And that's not a joke. That's a true story. I'll never forget, I got home, and it wasn't a very successful tour at all. But I had given everything I got. I was really inspired and encouraging one person at a time. That's what I was doing, right? That was my vision. That's what I was focused on. And it was also my mission. And I just knew that that's what I had to do. I had to keep on doing that going forward. This was 2007 when I did this tour. 13 years later, I get to be with you all. And the Energy Bus has now gone on to sell over 2 million copies. And I don't tell you that because I want you to be impressed with me because I don't think I'm impressive. I tell you that because I want you to think about what your vision is because I know that when you see it and you continue to work towards it, you're more likely to achieve it and ultimately have amazing success. We have to keep our vision alive on the journey because that's what drives grit. That's what drives us to keep moving forward. It inspires it. There's also purpose, the purpose element, right? We have to have a purpose for why we do what we do. We don't get burned out because of what we do. We get burned out because we forget why we do it. So your vision is, is knowing where you're going and your purpose is why you're going there. And on this journey, we got to keep both in mind as we're moving forward. I think about what you do and I know what you do really well. And I think about marathon runners. Most marathon runners do not quit the marathon in the first mile. And they don't quit in the last mile. Even though they've been running the longest, running the farthest, is when you think they should give up in the last mile, they don't. And why is that? Why do you think they, why do you think they don't give up? Because they could see it. Because they could see it, they keep on moving towards it. It shows the power of the mind. The body's tired. But the mind says, I see it, I have a vision, and I'm going to continue to move towards it. Most people quit in the 20th mile. 
That is when they're physically tired and then mentally drained. So what happens? They lose their vision, they stop moving forward, they give up, and they don't realize the destination of where they want to go. Listen, EXP, we have to we have to focus on our vision. We have to keep our vision alive now more than ever. Through the challenges, through the adversity, through the struggles, we keep our vision alive of, of where we want to go. We make sure that we fuel up with that vision every single day. I have a friend who's a a Navy SEAL, and he said, you know, John, a lot of the guys who are trying out the Navy SEAL don't make it through Hell Week because they're dreaming for it to end. They're longing for it to be over. The ones who make it are the ones who just say, I'm going to make it to breakfast, and then midday, and then at night. They focus on winning the moment. They focus on winning the day. And that's been my motto since all of this happened. I focus on winning the moment, winning each day. Like, just win today. That's my motto. Win today. And then win the next day. And then win the day after that. And then win the day after that. And if we win each day, we're going to win the future. But we got to focus on winning each day. That's where the power is. I want to encourage you, have a telescope, which is your big picture vision of where you want to go, right? And then have a microscope. That is your Zoom focus actions that you need to take each day to realize the picture in the telescope. And then the purpose that drives you every day. Every organization has a mission statement, but only the great ones have people who are on a mission. Are you on a mission? Do you have the vision? It's the vision and the mission that will keep on driving you forward. I'd love to know real quick in the, in the chat, what is what is your mission? What, what is your vision right now? And by the way, I'm gonna take questions at the end. So we're gonna have some great discussion. I wanna make this interactive, but, but right now, what is, what is your mission? What is your vision? As you move forward, as you as you know that you have to drive yourself forward, maybe you haven't thought about it, but now is a great time to really think about that. Security for my family, make a dream come true. I love that. Make a difference in people's lives, retirement. I love that. To inspire ten thousand agents to live a passive income and travel the world. Oh, man, that's amazing. Legacy begins at home. Be happy. Financial freedom. To live debt free. See, it's going to be different for each person. I thank you so much for sharing those. It's going to be different for each person, and that's the thing. You know, as you as you have the vision and mission, it's really what gives you meaning and mission, passion and purpose. That's what drives grit. So here's my challenge to you as, as we move past this one, this part of the formula of grit. Come up with a word for the year. What's going to be your word for the rest of the year that will drive you to be your best? Pick one word that will encourage you, inspire you, and give you meaning and mission, passion, and purpose. I don't know what your word is, but I know that we can all pick the word that will help us be our best. And for me, like my word this year is heart. I want to speak from the heart. I want to live with heart, right? I want to trust with all my heart. I want to love others with all my heart. And so that heart is what's driving me to be my best this year. And I want you to know, like, I'm a writer and speaker, so I've lost pretty much all of my all of my speaking engagements that were going to be in person. And the amazing thing is, I'm doing all these zooms now and virtual events and so forth. And so things have changed, but my vision hasn't changed. My vision remains the same, and it continues to drive me every day I wake up. And I know it's going to drive you. And your one word will drive you. I see two words there: trust and support. We have to pick one word. And I had I had someone they. Um, you know, they, they picked the word endurance. It was a teacher. She picked the word endurance. She told her she told her students, I will outlast you, is what she said. And then I had someone else pick the word retirement. And I said, no, no, you're not allowed to pick the word retirement because that's not going to help you, you finish. So he, he picked the word finish. He was going to he was gonna finish strong in all that he did. It was, it was that year that he was retiring. Right now he was looking to retirement. That might be a word if you want to create a great retirement, but he wanted to retire that year. I said, no, that's not going to drive you. So he picked, he picked finish and then he was finishing strong in everything he did. So, so grit is inspired by vision and purpose. The next part of the formula, it is fueled by optimism and belief. And this is where we move into the power of positivity and research from Duke university shows that optimists work harder, they get paid more and they're more likely to succeed in business and sports. And what they found, the research, researchers found about optimists was that because they believe in a brighter and better future, they then took the actions necessary to create it. Can you hear me? Can you 
y'all hear me, by the way? Yes, yes. we can hear yeah. you. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, there's like a question mark that's appearing in my mic on, so that's why. Okay, great. So what they found was that because they believed in a brighter and better future, they took the actions necessary to create it. It became a self-fulfilling prophecy. It's so funny, though, because the researchers used the term deluded, that they deluded themselves into believing that it was possible. And we might choose a different term, belief and faith, but it shows the power of the mind because you believe it and you think it's possible, you will work to create it and achieve it. And so there is the power of a positive mindset that allows us to move forward to create what we want to create. And this is not about seeing the world through rose-colored glasses. This is knowing that we're going to face some, some difficult challenges ahead. But this is knowing that we have the power to overcome the thorns. And I know this. Thorns shine the brightest in the darkness, and positive people shine the most through adversity. Your optimism is a competitive advantage. Your positivity, your belief, is a game changer. And what you believe right now will determine what you create. Our mindset, our beliefs are that powerful. And if you don't have it, you can't share it. So we have to make sure that we're feeding every day ourselves with positivity so that we can feed others. And I want to be honest and tell you, I'm, I'm not naturally positive. I actually struggle with, with positivity because you know I, I grew up in Long Island, New York, in a, in a Jewish Italian family. A lot of food, a lot of guilt, <laughs> a lot of wine, and a lot of whining. And my mom, she wanted the son the doctor, the son the lawyer. My brother goes to Johns Hopkins pre-med. I go to Cornell University pre-law. So she's telling all her friends, oh, my son the doctor, my son the lawyer. My brother came out an actor. I came out a bartender. She was, she was devastated. But I know that she'd be proud that I'm, I'm speaking with you all today. Um, my dad was a New York City police officer. He was an undercover narcotics. My dad was shot a few times. He was a very loving man, but just the most negative guy on the planet. <laughs> he'd get up in the morning and say, hey, good morning, Dad. He'd say, what's so good about it? My dad was Al Bundy before Al Bundy was Al Bundy. I just realized some of you, some of you have probably no idea who Al Bundy is. But growing up in that family, it made me want to be a, a more positive person. And so struggle with it. And then around 30 years old, I had two small children. It was during the dot-com crash. I lost my job. My life was falling apart. My wife and I were fighting all the time. And she said, I love you, but I'm not going to spend my life with someone who makes me so miserable. You need to change. And I agreed to change in that moment. And I began this journey of working to be a more positive person. And so I started to feed myself every day with positivity. And over time, it started to grow. I started to weed the negative, feed the positive. And I started to see my life change as I started to do that. And everything has changed as a result of, of finding this positivity within me. And being positive doesn't just make you better. It makes everyone around you better. And it's so essential because pessimists do not change the world. They say, they say you can't get Complainers complain about problems, but they don't solve them. Critics write words, but they don't write the future. Throughout history, it's the positive leaders, the believers, the dreamers, the doers that ultimately have the greatest impact. So... Maybe you're someone like me who doesn't have it, but guess what? You can feed it. And that's the great thing about this is you can discover and fuel yourself. There's a story about a man who goes to the village to the wise man. And he says to the wise man, I told you there are two dogs inside. One dog is this positive, optimistic, and energetic dog. And I'm this mean-spirited, angry, negative dog, and they fight all the time. I don't know who's going to win. The wise man thinks for a moment and says, I know who's going to win, the one you feed the most. So feed the positive dog. And every day we have that choice to feed the positive or the negative inside of us. And whichever one we feed, that's what grows. And the best advice I ever heard is from Dr. James Gill, the only person on the planet to complete six double Ironman triathlons. That's double Ironman, which means you do an Ironman, and then a day later you do another one. The last time he did it, he was 59 years old. He was asked how he did it. He said this, I've learned to talk to myself. Instead of listen to myself. So if I listen to myself, I hear all the fear, all the negativity, all the down, all the complaints. But if I talk to myself, feed myself with the words and the encouragement that I need to keep on moving forward. Who here needs to talk to themselves instead of listen to themselves? I know we all do, right? Talk to yourself every day. Encourage yourself. The word encourage, by the way, means to put courage into. So encourage yourself. Put courage into yourself. Put courage into others. Encourage them. 
And when you do, it's amazing how you win the battle of your mind. Because the negative thoughts are always coming. Let's be honest. We always have fear and doubt and discouragement and negative thoughts that come in all the time, right? Where you're not alone if you're, if you're feeling that. It's, it's very common to feel that way. But here's the thing. Just because you have a negative thought doesn't mean you have to believe it. Those negative thoughts are not coming from you. I'm going to blow your mind with this. They're not coming from you. How do I know? You would never choose to have a negative, negative. thought. You would never choose to. I just, I'm hearing some feedback there. Okay. You would never choose to have a negative thought. The thoughts come in from like the internet crap and consciousness. The brain is the hardware. Consciousness is the software. And we're always downloading thoughts. Just like when you're, when you're sleeping and you have dreams or nightmares. You're not choosing your dreams or nightmares. You're just having these thoughts that are coming in. Same thing when you're awake. But you don't have to believe those lies that are coming in and the fear that's coming in. What you want to do is speak truth to the lies. And that's what we're talking about here. That's what Dr. James Gills did. And the truth is, you're here to do great things. The truth is, you were never meant to be average. The truth is, there is greatness inside of you. And the reason why you want to do great things is because deep down, you know there's greatness, greatness within you. The challenge is we have these negative voices that say, you're not great. You're not going to succeed. It's not going to happen. This economy is going to hurt us going forward. It has all these fears and doubts. But the truth is, those who work hard, those who believe, those who stay positive, those who ultimately believe in a positive future will take the actions necessary to create it. That is truth. Both the Empire State Building and the Golden Gate Bridge were built during the Great Depression, during the 2006, the Great Recession that occurred in 2007, 2008, during that time. I was speaking to a bunch of real estate companies that were bringing me in to improve morale and to help people. And they were having awards at all these events. And I noticed something. Notice that all of these rookies were winning the awards. It was incredible that the rookies were winning the awards. And a lot of the veterans weren't. And it hit me. The veterans were longing for the good old days. They were complaining about the thing, way things were. They were unadaptable to change. The rookies didn't know about the good old days. They just knew what they knew. They put their head down, they worked hard, they developed their relationships, and they created their good old days right now. We want to think like rookies through the change, through the obstacles. We want to feed ourselves every day and have a rookie mindset of positivity, of power, of possibility, of optimism. And as we do, that will move us forward to create the future. As I said earlier, that pessimists don't change the world, but the optimists that have the greatest success going forward. So we got to feed ourselves on a daily basis. How do we do that? Well, as I said, we talk to ourselves instead of listen to ourselves. And one exercise you can do is on the left side of a piece of paper, you write down a lot of your negative thoughts and a lot of the patterns that come in for you often. And on the right side, you can write down truth that you will speak to those lies. You can write encouraging words that you will speak to those lies. And then as you, as you do that, after you do that exercise, you start speaking truth often. So that's a really great exercise. Like here's one, we get up in the morning, we can rise and shine or rise and whine. What will you choose? What will you choose? And I don't mean W-I-N-E. We don't want to rise in W-I-N-E. We want to rise and shine. And that could be our attitude for the day. Or we can win today. As I said earlier, that's what I'm saying. Win today. I'm saying survive, advance, adapt. And as we advance and adapt, we're going to thrive through the change, but on the other side of the change. And so those are, those are the things that I'm telling myself to think like a rookie. When you get up in the morning, you feel blessed or stressed. The research shows you can't be stressed and thankful at the same time. You're feeling grateful. You can't be stressed. So practicing gratitude is a great way to feed yourself every day. People ask me often, John, what did you do to have a more positive mindset since you were so negative? I started taking thank you walks where every day I would take a walk. While I was walking, I would just say what I'm grateful for. And when I was doing that, I was flooding my brain and body with these positive emotions that uplift me rather than stress hormones that slowly drain and kill me. And those walks of gratitude turned into walks of expectations, of hope and belief. And I would say often, like, I receive all the clients that want to work with me. I receive and accept all the great opportunities I have to speak. I accept all the books that I'm meant to write. And I would literally walk and practice gratitude. And every day I would do that. And I create a fertile mind that was ready for great things to happen. And maybe you don't do a thank you walk. Maybe you just do a thank you drive or a thank you bike ride or a thank you morning while you're, while you're drinking your coffee. 
whatever works for you. The key is gratitude is a great way to feed that positive dog on a daily basis. You can also choose to focus on what you get to do every day instead of what you have to do. That's a big shift I find with people. When we change have to to get to, we change a complaining voice to an appreciative heart. And I'm convinced abundance flows into our life when gratitude flows out of our heart. Yes, I love that one, Jeffrey. I, I say that often, right? You can get up in the morning and say, good morning, God, or good God morning, right? We can choose that every day. It's all about our perspective. How we see the world determines the world that we see. It's always about the perspective, right? And so knowing that we have to stay positive through the challenges, and this is not Pollyanna. We're talking about grit and resilience and optimism and belief to move forward. And so I'm just giving you a few tools on how to do that. But but I find that it gets you happy for me is, is really big. And then two more I want to share that are really essential. I love focusing on opportunities instead of challenge. I want to encourage you to turn your challenges into opportunities. Realizing every challenge is an opportunity to learn, to grow, to grow, and to get, and better. To get better. I um, work with a lot of major league baseball teams. And so one, so season, one season I was, I was visiting, visiting all the, all the um, um, Getting the echo feedback, feedback, by the way. One season, one I, was season I was actually going around, around and I was, and I was actually getting feedback still. So. Everybody's okay, so when um, I was visiting all those spring training facilities and I was going around and was saying, you know, John, baseball's a game of failure, John. It's a, it's a game of failure. They kept on saying that to me. And I said, you know what? I don't see it like that. You know, they, they said, yes, John, if you're an average player, right, you're failing two out of three times. Uh, you know, actually, no, you put down three out of four times as an average player. Three out of four. A Hall of Famer, you're failing two out of three. Even a Hall of Famer is failing two out of three. It's a game of failure. It's hard to stay positive in baseball. I said, I don't see it that way. So I see it as a game of opportunity. Because every at-bat is an opportunity to make the next one great. And so every day, we have the opportunity to make the next one great. Yes, we're going through a challenge. But what is the opportunity to do all of this? And through everything that we're going through, you always ask these questions. What can I learn from this experience? How can I grow from this experience? How can I get better because of this? And then what do I want now? What do I want to create as I move forward? And if you do that, you will always take your challenges and turn them into great opportunities. For instance, since we're not able to do live speaking or live trainings right now, we just had our first virtual live leadership training yesterday for my company, right? We have the Power of Positive Leadership training program. And we did our first one virtual yesterday. We had 150 people go through it. And it was epic. It was incredible. It went so well. It was our first one. We adapted within a month to put that on. Just like you all adapted to put this on, right? Just like your company is all about innovation and adaption. You are the model of that. This is why you're going to thrive. While others may struggle, you are going to dominate because others aren't adapting like you are. They're not taking their challenges to turn them into opportunities. A lot of them are complaining and wallowing, but not you. You're going to move forward with positivity and innovation and adaption. And that's what we did, right? And all of a sudden, we had this incredible event for training yesterday that wouldn't have happened, right, if we didn't face the challenge. So there is always something there. There is always something we can grow from it, always something we can learn from it and get better because of it. So take your challenges and turn them into opportunities. And then grit is powered by faith and hope. So I'm talking about feeding yourself every day. I want to encourage you to feed yourself with faith instead of fear. What do fear and faith have in common? They both believe in a future that hasn't happened yet. Fear believes in a negative future. Faith believes in a positive future. And if neither has happened yet, why wouldn't we choose to believe in the positive future? Why wouldn't we choose to believe that our best days are ahead of us, not behind us? That's why you're seeing optimism, positivity, faith, belief, drive grit. Because we believe it, and we have faith in a positive future, we continue to work towards it and move towards it. And that's the power of that. Now, we're going to deal with negativity. We're going to deal with people I call energy vampires. We're going to deal with some naysayers out in the world. So that's why it's so important to recognize that it's not just about being positive, but we also have to be positive and more positive than all the obstacles and negativity that we face. I remember telling my dad, I, I want to be a writer and speaker, dad. I, I found my calling. His response is, what the heck do you want to do that for? That's a load of junk. That won't amount to anything. A couple of years later, I got on the Today Show. It was my first time being on national television, and I was terrified. 
I got to the green room and they sat me next to Queen Latifah. We had this, this incredible conversation. She was amazing. And it came my time to go be with Katie Kirk. And as I was walking towards the door, Queen yelled, you go energy guy. And I went out there and I coached several people on enhancing their energy and their optimism for their work. And as I walked out of the studio, who called me on the phone? But my dad. He's like, your mother, I just saw you on TV. You really made a difference. We're so proud of you. We always knew you could do it. He didn't remember being negative. He didn't remember being an energy vampire. And I learned a valuable lesson from that experience. Your positive energy must be greater than all the negativity. Your certainty, your belief, your faith must be greater than all the doubt. Gandhi said, I will not let anyone walk through my mind with their dirty feet, and neither should you. Don't allow anyone to walk through your mind with their dirty feet. Don't allow others to sabotage your vision, your mission, your optimism, your belief, and what ultimately you want to create. you got to overcome the negativity. Same thing with teams. I work with a lot of teams. And the biggest mistake that leaders and teams make is they do not address the negativity that exists on a team. We have to make sure that we address the negativity so that we can have more grit together, so that we're stronger together. My wife and I just wrote a book called Relationship Grit. It comes out at the end of August, and it's all about you know, our ups and downs and how we stayed together and we, we stuck through it all, right? And we didn't allow eventually at the end you know, the negativity to sabotage it. In the course of it, yeah, that could have. But we kept on working through it. We addressed it. We weren't going to allow it to continue. We fed the positive and, 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 and weeded the negative. And as a result of that, we wound up having a strong relationship right now. But there are many times that we wanted to give up and we could have given up. So team-wise, it's so important that we don't allow negativity to sabotage our team as well. I was working with a college football program, a big-time program. I've worked with Clemson football for the past eight years now, amongst other programs, including Oregon. And I've also worked with the LA Rams the last few years and the San Diego Chargers, Miami Dolphins. Um, but I want you to know that not every team I, I work with wins. I worked with the Cleveland Browns last year. I didn't have a lot of success with them, although I did, I did love those guys. And I rooted for those guys. If you're from Cleveland, I want you to know I rooted for those guys. And, you know, when I was working with this one team, and they all read the energy bus, I spoke to the team. And after I spoke, they lost the first two games. I thought I ruined them. I sent Coach a text. I said, Coach, I still believe in you all. And... The coach responded back, John, the guys are staying positive. They're still on the bus. In years past, we've allowed energy vampires to sabotage our team, but not this year. This year, we won't allow it. In their big meeting room, they put a huge picture of an energy vampire on the wall. And anytime one of the players was being an energy vampire, they took their picture from the media guy and they put it on the wall. No one wanted to be on the wall. They wanted to win the next 10 games in a row, making it to the SEC championship game. Amazing. I learned right then and there that a team that stays positive together wins together. That we have to address the negativity. We create it in, as part of our culture. And then as we do that, we grow, we feed the positive, we use our challenges, opportunities, and we don't allow the negativity to sabotage us and our team, and we have more success as we go forward. So just make sure that you're always feeding the positive, addressing it. Now, as a team, you might have some you know, difficult conversation. You might have some conflict. That's okay. All teams fight. All teams have disagreements. As long as you're you're focusing on positive intention, positive focus, and addressing the negativity, where you can have great conversations and talk, you're going to thrive through that. You know, Ali Long, who was on the World Cup team for the U.S. Women's Soccer Team, she told me after every game, they would actually get together and they would debrief. They would get together and they would debrief and talk about who messed up, who did things wrong, who needed to get better how they can improve. They talk about positive things too, but no one took it personal. I said, how do they not take it personal? She said, we all want to be great together. We all knew that we had to get better. We all knew we had to have these conversations. So it became part of our culture. And as a result of that, we were able to thrive and win a championship. Such a great example of the power of a positive team, that women's soccer team. So I see it all the time. And the key is for grit, that we are inspiring with vision and purpose. We are fueling it with optimism and belief. We are powering it with faith and hope as we move forward. And we're not letting the negativity to sabotage us on our journey. So we continue to move forward. And trust me, there is a lot of negativity out there, right? Don't let the critics in your head and don't let praise go to your head. Don't let the negative voices bring you down, right? Know that you're more positive than they are. And then, this is my favorite part of the program. My favorite part. I love this part of the program. It's... Grit is driven by love. 
fucking love. Like if you don't love it, you'll never be great at it. So it's the love that drives us. It's the love of our family. I saw many of you put in family. That was your motivation. That was your vision and mission to support them and provide for them. Yeah, because you love your family, you're not going to quit. And you're not going to quit on your team and you're not going to quit on them. When you love it, you keep on driving to do what you do. That's what drove me. Like I loved this. I loved encouraging people. I loved inspiring people. I loved making a difference. I knew this was my calling, this was my purpose, and so nothing was going to stop me, even though everything said I should give up. I had a woman that come, came to see me speak early in the early days. She was an event planner. She was a friend of a friend, and she came to speak to see me speak, and she told my friend that I should quit, that I wasn't going to do very well, and I couldn't make this a career, but I couldn't because my love was greater than her opinion of me. Your love is greater than all of your challenges that you will go through. Famous opera singer Pavarotti was asked about his discipline, like how he had such great discipline for his work, for his craft. He said, you know, everyone thinks it's discipline, but it's not discipline. He said, it's devotion. He was so devoted to his craft and that drove his discipline. And it's your devotion that will drive your discipline. You don't love it. It's actually really hard to be disciplined because you're always forcing yourself. It's like you're climbing uphill or swimming against the current, right? But if you get back to loving it and focusing on the love that you have for your craft and what you're building and the love that you have for your team and your clients, right, and serving them, which we're going to talk about in a second, you talk about loving and serving them, guess what? That's going to continue to drive you forward and you're going to continue to, to, to be your best and you're not going to give up. So love is what drives discipline. I also love love because it also casts out fear. A lot of times we have fear that sabotages us and the fear gets in the way of our mission, gets in the way of our vision. It really paralyzes us. And so the fear keeps us from being our best. I heard it said that, that fear, the second most powerful force in the universe, and it's the number one thing that can keep you from your destiny. Thankfully, love is the most powerful force in the universe and it casts out fear. So the minute you're, you're loving it, you won't fear it. And I, I really discovered this when I was writing my book, The Carpenter. Because I, I couldn't write. I had writers. I never had I never had fear before. For the first time, I was so fearful of writing, I literally couldn't even write. And so I was stuck. And then one morning I woke up. It was like a dream I had. I woke up with this realization, with this eureka moment. That all I had to do was love the reader. I had to love the process of writing. I had to love what I was doing. If I just loved it, I wouldn't fear it. And I had to get back to that. Because I was worried people were going to think that my best books were behind me, that my new book was a piece of junk, that I was you know, no longer able to and capable of writing a good book. And so I wrote all these fears. And then I said, no, just get back to loving it and loving writing. Well, I did. I wrote that book in two and a half weeks after that. It made its way into the story. And now I've been sharing it ever since with a lot of realtors, with, with professional athletes, with business folks, you name it. And so many people are using, so many people are using it as principal. For greater success, a lot of sports teams I work with are now using this. And I, I think about the love that they all have for their craft and how that love drives them to be truly great. I want to give you one example. I think it's a great example because we've all been through this. There was a field goal kicker, and he was really stuck and not playing well. It was on ESPN that he was going to get cut. And so I saw it on ESPN. I reached out to him. I said, "Hey, what's going on?" He said, oh, "I'm just so full of fear." I said. Tell me, what, tell, tell me about your rookie season if you weren't feeling fear then. He goes, I was loving it. I was living my dream. I was in the NFL. So, of course, I was loving kicking. I said, tell me about this year. It was his second year of kicking. He said, I don't want to let my team down. I missed a couple kicks in preseason. I don't want to lose what I have. I don't want to upset coach and give it all away. He said, you, you see what's happening here? You're so full of fear. you got to get back to love how you became successful in the first place. Just get back to loving kicking, loving the opportunity, loving the chance to compete. And if you do that, fear will dissipate because love casts out fear. He did that, and he's been in the NFL since. A great career. And it was so cool to see him turn it around. And it wasn't me. I just reminded him of the truth that he had forgotten. Remember, love casts out fear. Love drives grit. Love drives you. And love is what makes us great at what we do. You gotta focus on the love if you truly want to be great. And there's another word I said that it was earlier, serve. Like if you love, you're gonna serve. Because if you love someone, you're gonna serve them. 
So when you when you love your clients, you're going to serve them even more. I remember visiting my mom in, in, in South Florida. And by the way, my mom was a, was a realtor. So I want you to know that. So I love realtors because my mom was a realtor. And I remember visiting my mom in South Florida where she worked. And we were taking a, a, a walk together. And she got tired. And my mom never got tired. She was an energizer buddy. A walk and talking machine. Five, two energizer buddy. I got my height from her, unfortunately. And so we're taking this walk. My brother's six two. I don't know what happened to me. So we're now we're now walking and I said, Mom, let's turn back. She said, No, no, no. I want to go to the grocery store. I want to get you some stuff to make you a sandwich. And so we kept on going. I'm like, all right, fine. We got to the store, we got the stuff, we made our way back, and she was exhausted. And she got into the kitchen. First thing she did was walk right into that kitchen and she made me a sandwich. And I ate that sandwich on my, my drive home. It was a five hour drive home. I live in North Florida. So my mom thought I would uh, die of starvation if I'd have a sandwich for my drive. And I ate that sandwich, but I didn't think much about the sandwich at the time. And I didn't think much about, about that. I didn't think much about that sandwich for a while, to be honest. But now I think about that sandwich all the time because that was the last time I saw my mom fully conscious. The last time I saw her fully alive. The last time after that was in a hospital, she was dying. She had cancer and she would tell us how bad it was. And yet it's really bad. And I think about that often, like here she was dying of cancer. It was really bad, but she wanted to go and get me a sandwich. And she wanted to go make, I'm sorry, the ingredients. She wanted to go make me a sandwich. That was the biggest thing that she could do in that moment. And we often think that, that loving and serving is about the big things. Always remember, it's about the little things that we do with a big dose of selfless love. Little things, but big dose of selfless love. It's about serving others. You don't have to be great to serve, but I am convinced that you have to serve to be great. And when we serve and sacrifice for others, we become truly great in their eyes. And so we love and then we serve and that drives us forward. And guess what? My mom was number one in her company. No accident. At her funeral, several of her clients came. And it was so cool because they came up to me, they told me all these stories about my mom and what she did as a realtor. She would like go walk their dog. She would make them food like the Jewish mom that she was. She would try to set them up on dates. And I found out all these things that she did. And it was incredible. Like she really did put her, her clients first. She really did serve them. And that serving led to this incredible career and growth as a result of that. So I know that when we love and we serve, we, we truly drive ourselves forward to have the grit we need to be successful. And then the last word on that is, is care. So I want you to remember this. And it's, it's a hashtag. You can tweet if you want, at John Gordon 11 if you want, J-O-N Gordon 11 That's my Twitter, at J-O-N Gordon 11 uh, Love, serve, care. Love, serve, care. But these are the key principles for not just grit, but for leadership and for growth and for success, the greatest leadership and success principles of all. And when I think of care, I think of difference between average and greatness. Like caring is what separates average and greatness. Because you care, you show up every day and you put your heart and soul into what you're building. You could be just like a carpenter and show up and build something, or you could be a craftsman or a craftswoman. And a craftsman or a craftswoman, they put their essence into what they're building. They put their heart, their soul, their love, and their care. And it's that caring that separates something that's average and a masterpiece. And we know when we care more, we do more, give more, and become more. So I always think of like, how can we care more? How can we have our caring trademark? Like your caring trademark is your unique attribute that shows that you care. And everyone's different, right? Some people love to cook. Some people treat people like family. Some people walk dogs. Some people just provide incredible service and reach out and say, how are you doing? I read that after real estate transaction, 98% of realtors, 98% do not follow up to see how their client is doing, to see if they're happy with their home and the transaction. 98% do not follow up. So just being that 2% and caring more will produce so many more referrals and so much more success as you go forward. Love and serve and care. It's what separates average and greatness. There's a, a word that I want you to remember when you think of caring. It's called Meraki. Meraki, M-E-R-A-K-I, M-E-R-A-K-I, Meraki. It sounds like it's a Japanese word, but it's actually a Greek word. And it means 
means to do something with love. It means to leave a piece of yourself in your work. It means to leave something behind. Meraki. We can all do that, right? We can love what we do. We can leave a piece of ourselves in our work and in our clients. And we can leave something behind. And that, that's the legacy. I saw it early on when I asked for purpose. Many said legacy and impacting lives. This is a group I know that is really about others. And when you are about others, when you help others grow, you grow. When you help others improve, you improve. Meraki is all about leaving something behind. And that is your legacy. That is the people that you have touched. That is the homes that you have helped people move into and the dream home they've always wanted. And they'll think of you. They'll remember you. We always remember our realtors who, who impacted us and helped us get into the homes we got into. I can still remember Steve Gold who got me into my first home in Atlanta years ago when I was uh, 26, 27 years old. So I still remember, you know, I, I still remember our conversations as we were driving our comfort places. You always remember that. So focus on the love and the serve and the care. And then one final one final piece before we take questions and, and make it a lot more interactive. A grit is always created from the inside out. So let me review real quick if you're, if you're taking notes. Grit is inspired by vision and purpose. It is fueled by optimism and belief. It is powered by faith and hope. It is driven by love and it is created from the inside out. What do I mean by that? Well, let me give you an analogy. Be like the carrot, the egg, and the coffee bean. The life is like a big pot of boiling hot water. And when you put a carrot into boiling hot water, what happens to the carrot? It gets weakened, it gets softened by its environment. When you put an egg into boiling hot water, what happens? It gets hardened by its environment. We can be like the carrot and allow our circumstances, allow all of this that's going on to weaken us, to cause us to crumble, to, to have the kind of pressure where we just can't withstand it. We lose our way. That's what happened to me during the dot-com crash when all the adversity hit. My circumstances got us to me. I did not pass that test well. I lost that test, just so you know. That would prepare me to be a different person. That would prepare me to have more faith, more optimism, more belief as I would go forward. It would prepare me for this moment where I could be a light for others. So it wasn't lost. It happened, but I definitely failed that test. And now what happens to a lot of people is they're being like the carrot or they're being like the egg where they get hardened and bitter and angry. And we can allow our circumstances and our situations to do that. But that bitterness and anger, and anger only holds us back. It only keeps us from becoming all that we're meant to be. We can't look backwards can only look forwards. We can't look at what we've lost. We can only look at what we'll gain. We can become more during this time, or we can become less during this time. And I'm deciding, I'm making a commitment to become more during this time. I'm making a commitment to focus on creating the future, not worrying about and looking back into the past. So when we do that, when we do that, we don't get bitter. We don't get angry. We don't allow it to sabotage us. So we don't want to be like the egg. We want to be like the coffee bean. When you are a coffee bean and you're put into boiling hot water, the coffee bean is not impacted by its environment. The coffee bean transforms its environment. It transforms the water from the inside out. We don't even call it water anymore. We give it a new name. We call it coffee. It has that kind of impact. It transforms it. And that is your power every day. You can transform every interaction, transform every community, every team from the inside out. The power is on the inside. Do not allow your circumstances to define you. Instead, you define your circumstances. The power is within you. And that is what you want to remember as you move forward. Create from the inside out. Be the coffee bean, not the carrot, not the egg. If you like this message, I wrote a book called The Coffee Bean, the 20 minute read with pictures. It's such a simple message, but it's so powerful. I'm not trying to be self-promotional. I only tell you that because it's a great resource that a lot of organizations are using now to help them focus on what they can control, not what they can't. Talk about an innovation and infection. I worked recently, well not recently, but a couple of years ago with, with Snapchat. Evan Spiegel reached out, he read my book, The Power of Positive Leadership. He is the founder of Snapchat and the CEO is only 30 years old and incredible genius and brilliant. And he had me uh, come speak to his leadership team. And on my way there, I said, what do you want me to talk about? And I'm thinking they're going to say, you know, cost benefits analysis and positivity. Give us the research and the data and all that good stuff. 
because they were very smart people. And I said, I'm sure you want me to talk about those things. He said, no, no. He said, just help us stay positive. Just help us stay positive is what he said. Because Instagram was coming at it. They were getting hammered in the media. Wall Street was getting on it. They were hearing all this negative noise, all this negativity from the outside. And they were in the pot of boiling hot water. And they were being like carrots. And they were being like coffee beans. And so I went there and I talked about what I shared with you today. And they made a commitment as a leadership to the focus on what they control, stay positive, continue to work hard, execute their game plan, and not listen to the noise. And if you follow Snapchat over the last two years, they have had amazing success. Evan recently spoke about this in my, my podcast, Positive University. He actually talked about how positivity was such a huge factor in his success and what, what he's doing going forward. And again, not I didn't do it. He did it. I just reminded him of the truth as like I'm sharing with you today. And so I, I share that because I want you to know there's like real life examples, great examples of teams, organizations, people that live these principles and they have amazing success as a result of that. Clemson football being one of them. And I saw it play out firsthand working with that team to a national championship. And I've seen realtors turn around their business. I've seen them grow their business by implementing these principles. And I get emails all the time. Hey, John, I read the carpenter. I read the energy bus. And I'm doing this, this, and this. And I'm having this success. And nothing gives me more joy than hearing that. Because for me, what drives me, the grit, is that purpose of impacting the love of the people I get to work with, like you, I get the impact, and the love of doing this kind of work and seeing people go from negative to positive. So that's my formula for grit. What I'd love for you to put in the chat right now is, like, what's the, the, the biggest takeaway for you? What really stood out to you the most as part of the formula that you know that you need to focus on? If you want, you could even put your own formula for grit. Like, this is not about my formula. Like, I want you to have your own formula that's going to drive you forward. So out of out of what I shared today, like, what's going to be your own little formula? If you want to be a plus sign, an equal sign, you can. But what's going to be your biggest takeaway in your own little formula for grit as you move forward? I had to drink some water. <laughs> Giving a virtual talk, by the way, is, is, a, is a lot more exhausting than being on stage when you have all the, the energy of the, of the audience. But you give me energy right now with these comments, so it's awesome. Walk in love, love God, love others, love it. Grit is determined by, by attitude. Volatility equals opportunity. Weed and feed, serving others. Positive and serve. Weed and feed, love and serve. Could you repeat your formula? I was asked. Okay, here it is again. I'll actually give you my whole formula right now if you want. I'm not. I don't have time to cover the whole thing. I'll give you the, the whole formula. Right? Grit is inspired by vision and purpose. It is powered. Oh, sorry. It is inspired by vision and purpose. It is fueled by optimism and belief. Powered by faith and hope. Driven by love. It is revived by resilience kept alive by stubbornness, and if we're honest, includes some fear of failure and desire to prove oneself, and it is created from the inside out. And we didn't talk about resilience, mm -hmm. desire to prove oneself, a little fear of failure. Yeah, Real quick, a little fear of failure is actually a good thing. It pushes you, but we don't want the it's major fear that paralyzes us. So like, I have love for what food. we're doing today and love for you, but there's always a little fear of failure that maybe I don't have it today. Maybe I'm not going to connect today and make a difference. And that little fear drives me to be on my A game, to give my best. So there is a little fear there. The love has to be greater, but I'm going to be honest, there's a little fear. We all know that, right? That's something I'm sure many of us have. We wake up today, uh, maybe it's not going to be a great day. Okay, I have a little fear, right? but I'm going to focus on the love. I know this little fear is also driving me a little bit. So it's, it's, it's the two together. Okay, if you, were that, um, if you choose love, you can over anything. anything. Okay. Thank you so much for sharing. I love these insights. I love what you're sharing. This is great. By the way, um, on social media, I put the uh, the grit formula, but I'll put it again. I'll put it. I'll actually just tweet it out today, so you have it. And I'll just just go to my Twitter at John Gordon Eleven or Instagram at John Gordon Eleven. We'll put it on there, and I'll, I'll put it on there if you have it. Or you also, uh, you all can send it out to each other as well. Okay. So now I'd love to take some questions. Feel free to ask me anything you want to ask me. I'm open. And you can ask me if you want.
And I love someone just said, I love, I refuse to let my marriage fall. I love that. I'm too stubborn to let my mother-in-law be right. <laughs> well, okay, that's, that, that's good. I mean, if, if, she's, if she's trying to say that your marriage shouldn't succeed, yes, be stubborn in that. Especially if you know you and your husband are supposed to be together, you fight for the marriage, right? You shouldn't. Okay. Um, what is the one limiting belief you would ask us to unlimit today? The one limiting belief that I would ask you to unlimit today would be that I am not worthy. I don't deserve this. So often we don't create the success we want because we feel unworthy and we don't feel like we deserve this. You are worthy. You deserve this. You are here to do great things. You were born to do great things. So if I was giving more of a spiritual talk, I would tell you you're a child of God. I don't like, you know, this is, this is a business talk, but you are here to do great things. And there's purpose and passion inside of you. I would tell you that. Don't believe those lies. What, what book of yours would you recommend to read first? Always the energy bus. Always start with the energy bus. It's my most popular book. It seems to be the most popular. Um, one of my, uh, one of your favorite books, but not your own. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to talk about other books. Um, I was gonna say no. I only talk about my books, no other books. No, I'm actually I love. I'm here. I'm hoping to read the greatest salesman right now by Ogmandino, and my mom gave it to me when I graduated college, and so it's a, a powerful book that impacted my life. Ogmandino, uh, the greatest salesman in the world, and again, that's you know something I have right here sitting. It reminds me of my mom. Ken Blanchard's my greatest mentor, uh, who wrote the One Minute Manager. He wrote the forward to the Energy Bus, and he had a huge impact in my life. Is there a way to listen to this later? Uh, you can ask your folks. I'm sure there is. Hopefully, I'm sure it's recorded. Uh, where can we read about the coffee bean? Oh, just go to just go to my social media. You'll see post on the coffee bean website. The Google coffee bean, John Gordon. You'll see it. Uh, let's see. Any other questions? Where do we find your podcast? It's called Positive University. Positive University. It's it's, uh, it's all on uh, Apple, iTunes. And positiveuniversity.com. Just had Matthew McConaughey on my podcast. That's a, that's an opportunity that came from the challenge because he's at home. He had a lot of time. I reached out to the AD of Texas because I work with Texas football and Texas sports. I said, Hey, I know Matthew's a huge fan. He works with you all. Do you think you can ask him to be on my podcast? He asked him. He was on it. And you can find that at positiveuniversity.com. Any challenges you want to ask me? I, I really want this to be about you, not me promoting my stuff. Anything that you. I want to ask me that I can help you with a challenge you're facing or something that I didn't share uh, today. How do you gain confidence as someone new to any field with no experience? You know, how do you gain confidence? You prepare. So you're not going to have a lot of confidence in the beginning. I know a lot of people begin a new sport, they don't have confidence. I tried to play the guitar the other day. I had no confidence because I, I couldn't do it. It was my first time. So you have to prepare. You have to work at it. And confidence is going to come from doing the work and from preparing and having a mindset that, I'm going to grow in this. I'm not going to allow my failure to define me. I'm going to let it refine me. And know that you're not failing when you try something new. You're becoming. You're not failing. You're becoming. So that's a great question. Uh, how do you overcome uh, some of the chats you're going to, uh, I'm trying to keep up with the questions. How do we help people that are sinking from negativity and fear all around them? Such a great question. You know, I've learned you can't drive anyone else's bus. You can only drive your bus, but you can help people along the way. You can encourage them. But people are struggling. My son's a, a sophomore in, in college, and he just, you know, finished his sophomore year, was home for a few months. And that's another been another opportunity that he and I got to spend a lot of time together. He really struggled this sophomore year. He had some, you know, depression and so forth, like a lot of college kids have. And I was really there for the last few months home where I'm usually on the road. And I spent a lot of time investing in it. So I, I spoke life into him. I encouraged him. I kept on helping him with good habits because he had a lot of bad habits that were causing him to be depressed. Like going to bed at 6 in the morning, like that's not going to help you feel better. So I've been working with him a lot and not giving up, having grit to stay with it. And it's so cool in the beginning, he didn't want to listen to me. And by the end, we've created such a bond as a result of me going through the tough times, going through the hard stuff where you really wouldn't listen to that. Like people, you know, you know, he knows a lot of people listen to me, but, but he won't. And that was a challenge, but again, an opportunity and just constantly supporting him, giving things to read, 
Finally, he listened to a sermon I shared with him the other day, and he listened to it on, on driving, and he called me up. He's like, Dad, I listened to that. I got goosebumps. I needed that. Wow. I didn't think he would listen to it. And I sent him sermon after sermon, message after message. He finally listened to this last month. So you don't give up, and I think you keep encouraging. Hope that helps. Um, let me ask what sermon was it? From Erwin McManus. Erwin McManus. What the Joy, it's called. It was a recent one called What the Joy. And I Am Worthy, it was called Bachelor too. I Am Worthy, and then there's another one, I Am Good. Erwin McManus. Um, when you were negative and feeding on your positivity, what was your main thing that helped you believe and overcome the struggle? Oh, it was definitely the thank you walks. I mean, it really was like every day just talk, taking a walk of gratitude and reading the, reading the negative and feeding the positive and doing that every day. Think of your mind like a garden. You can read the negative and feed the positive. Do it one day. It's not going to do a whole lot. Let's say you do it for a week. Then you do it for a month. Then you do it for a year. Then you do it for, like I've been doing it now, probably 16 years now. That garden of your mind starts to look pretty magnificent the more you read the negative feed the positive. So just make sure you're reading and feeding every day over time. If you have a question, just yeah, type it again because I've lost all your questions on top. So if you have another one, just type it again now. Can you fake it until you make it? No, I don't believe in fake it until you make it. I actually tweeted this the other day. I believe in believing it, and when you believe it, you'll see it. I believe in acting like you belong because you do. Not faking it until you make it, knowing you belong because you do. That's what I believe. What's your parting words as you enter the gates of heaven? Um, I hope I made a difference. People ask, like, legacy. Like, what's your legacy for the future? It's really helpful to think at the end in mind. Stephen Covey talked about that. And here's my end in mind. Uh, someone will meet my kids, and uh, I'll, I'll be long gone. Hopefully it's going to be a long time from now, but maybe not. You never know. My mom died at 59. But I, I often think, I want them to meet my kids and say, your dad's book or his talk made a difference in my life. And something he something he wrote, something he said, impacted me. And that drives me every day to, to, to make a difference, one person at a time. Thank you so much for saying that. So people say you made a difference. Like, oh, that, that's everything. Like, makes gives me tears. A vision board uh, to see things is OK. Yeah, I think a vision board is great. I know uh, Clemson football did vision boards the year they won the national championship. Um, you know, if you could see it, you can create it. So put it up, have it as a reminder. And you pick your one word, make a painting, pick a, pick a, uh, pick something that you can carry around with you with your one word on it. We have a lot of people do one word rocks. You know, there's that my intent company that does one word little uh, chains and so forth. Um, one word is a great idea. Yeah. Any other questions that you want to ask me? Thank you. Uh, what is what's been your biggest success to date? Um, being married for 23 years, coming up uh, May 17th. <laughs> May 17th. Oh, by the way, I got to tell you this. I I asked my wife on a scale of one to ten, how much do you like to be married to me? On a scale of one to ten, how much do you like to be married to me? She said, pre-COVID or now. <laughs> so. Uh, it's a good thing we were a relationship grit together. We like each other after all these years. Uh, but yeah, 23 years coming up. And uh, we've spent a lot of time together uh, through this, like a lot of relationships have. I, I make a joke. I know it's also been challenging for a lot of relationships too. I want to be cognizant of that. But I know that stick together and you really work at investing in the relationship and focus on the relationship and making a priority and listen to each other and grow together your relationship's going to become stronger as a result of that. And in this book that we have coming out at the end of August, my wife shares all, like, it's a tell-all. Like, we're, we don't hide any secrets. We're sharing what I did wrong, the mistakes I made. We're sharing, like, the problems we had, how we grew together. And if we can make it, I know you can make it. Trust me, if we can make it, you can make it. How do you find purpose that helps put, push you forward? You know, I can't, it's not like you could manufacture it. It really is about asking the question, why am I here? What am I going to do? What is my purpose? And just being open to that. Just being open to what that purpose is. That's what I started with, asking that question. Just be open to it. And then that purpose is really also about starting to live with more purpose. Find a, find a smaller why of how you can impact someone every day and live 
that try to live with more passion and purpose. And as you do that, and you look for ways to love, serve, and care, what you'll find is that your bigger purpose will start to be revealed to you. It'll start to come through you. So when we live on our purpose, we often find our purpose, or rather our purpose finds us. How do you get out of a burnout? Mm. We don't get burned out because of what we do. We get burned out because we forget why we do it. So the way we get out of a burnout is, is, is sometimes we have to take a little bit of a break, though. We have to you know, take a little time, really take a, take a lot of walks, allow yourself to read and reflect and meditate, pray, find some reflection alone time, and then really get clear on, on your why on how you want to make a difference and a greater purpose will fuel you to make you know a greater impact and it will also wake you up like some days we get up we don't feel very po- we don't feel very positive but let's be honest some days we don't feel very positive that's when we need a bigger purpose to give us something to be positive about so that purpose will drive your positivity uh, so often and for me that's what it is you know you, i woke up a little sore throat today not, not feeling the best but the minute we start doing this, my purpose will make you feel more positive, and your purpose will, will drive you. We just got to tap into it. Training Camp is my favorite book I've read. My favorite. Oh, you always ask me, you have a favorite? I don't have any favorites of my kids. I have two kids. I love them both the same, just differently. But I do have a favorite book, and it's, it's Training Camp. Uh, let's see, what else? Someone said, I love being married. That's why I've done it four times. That is really funny. <laughs> Thank you for making me laugh on that one. <laughs> Everyone else is laughing too. <laughs> Might have to use that one going forward. <laughs> Charlie Tremendous Jones used to say, like, uh, he used to say, um, you know, I grew up in a large family. I didn't sleep alone until I got married. What was your favorite book that I've written? It's a uh, training camp that I've read several soul keeping by John Orberg, a million miles and a thousand years by Donald Miller is one of my favorites. Okay. Knowing, um, uh, knowing what you know now, what would you tell your younger self? You know, I'm going to be honest. It's, everything I write in all my books, I've written 20 books, 22 now actually with the garden coming out and uh, 22 books. And I, I, every book I write is basically what I would tell myself and what I would tell my kids. I would write when my kids were growing up as they, as I was writing. Now they're 21 and 20. My daughter's gonna be 22 coming up. And so as I, as I, as I would write, I would write what I would wanna tell them if I passed away. After, if I did not live, after writing this book. My mom passed away so young, so I would always think, like, this was the last book I wrote, what would I want to say and leave behind? And those were the books. But it's everything we talked about today. But the greatest thing I probably tell myself is stop worrying about it. Life is short. Go for it. Don't worry about the future. Just win today, as I said earlier. I would just tell myself that, like, have fun, enjoy life. Go in life to arrive at your final destination as late as possible with a smile on your face. Because if you do that, it means you really enjoy the ride. And I would I would like to enjoy the ride and have, have more fun. I always, always, you know, stressed and, you know, and even, even now I'll still get stressed at times. And I have to remind myself, life is short. Enjoy the ride. Great term, uh, my friend Ryan Holiday. Life is short. Enjoy Ego is the enemy and obstacle is the way. And, and Ryan talks about memento mori. And memento mori means, you know, it's a Latin phrase for meaning you will die. And um, right now we're hearing a lot about that in the news. But the idea is that knowing that you're going to die one day, you know, is actually not, should not be a morbid thought. It should be a thought that says, you know what, no one's going to get out of your life. So how can I make the most of today and, and live fullest today? And if we do that, right, that's truly living. Living in fear is not living. Living with fear and stress and anxiety is not living. So how can we live to our fullest today? As I, I want to help people live more fully in their life. And, um, you know, the garden's coming out now, and the garden is literally at the end of June. The garden is really about how to live more fully, and it's the five Ds that will sabotage you, and how to overcome the five Ds. And the Ds are doubt, discouragement, distortion, lies, distraction, division. 
And the word anxious actually means uh, divided. So when we're anxious, we feel divided. And so how can we be more united with ourselves and with others to not feel that anxiety? And so that's, that's, that's what I would tell myself. Don't be anxious. Don't worry. Make the most of today. Love people and everything we talked about. And trust. Just trust. Trust. You won't have doubt. If you trust, fear will fade away. If you trust, somehow, some way, things will work out. I guess I could take maybe a couple more questions. What would you tell someone who is, is trying to skirt the deep issues with motivation, self-improvement, purpose, and being a true entrepreneur? I would show them. Well, actually, I would, I would help them identify what they really want and what they want to create. I would ask them how they're going to get there. So what do you want to create and how are you going to get there? And ask them what their plan would be and see what they would come up with. And then ask them how you're going to overcome challenges, how you're going to overcome this, and see what they would say. And say, you know, you have this idea of what you want, but to get there, you're going to need this, this, and this. You're going to need motivation. You're going to need inspiration. You're going to need encouragement. You're going to need a greater purpose. So I would help them see that they want to, they get, want somewhere, to get somewhere, but they're not going to get there by themselves. And that they need sort they need other sources of power to get there. And then from there, I would see if they were open to what they are. So that would be like the more subtle way to do it. Or you could just say, hey, why don't we read this book together and talk about it? It doesn't have to be mine. It could be any book. And say, hey, why don't you read this? Let's talk about it and see if it encourages you. You know, Chewy Cathy said, how do you know if a man or a woman needs encouragement if they're breathing? And Zig Ziglar was often asked, Zig was asked about motivation. He, he was like, Zig, you know, how is motivation good? Zig, motivation doesn't last. And he would say, you know, he'd say, neither does a bathing. That's why you have to do it every day. And so... We need motivation every day. Five needs if someone asked uh, doubt, distortion, lies, discouragement, distractions, you're the enemy of greatness. And then, by the way, someone just said my TED talk. Yeah, I did a TEDx talk. I landed. I had just spoken to the 49ers, the San Francisco 49ers. I landed in Ohio, and I get off the plane, and I was there to speak at an education conference the next day. So I arrived in the afternoon, and when I arrived, I only had like four hours sleep. They said, hey, um, you're wearing Ted shirts. And I said, oh, I love Ted. They said, well, our speaker just canceled. Do you want to speak? <laughs> I was like, no, I don't want to speak. I, uh, I didn't get any sleep. I just went to the 49ers. I'm exhausted. And as we're driving to the, uh, the hotel, I thought to myself, you know, what's your vision and mission, John? Is it to impact people? How could you turn this down? I said, how many people are going to be there? They said, 500 people. I said, all right, I'll do it. So we got to the hotel, I changed my suit, drove me to the event, and I literally got on stage and gave a spontaneous TED talk that I didn't even plan. <laughs> I didn't even plan. I just winged it. And it came out pretty cool. So, uh, you know, that's, uh, you know, that, I guess it's an example of just going for it, right? And not allowing fear to define you. Other questions? Any challenges you're facing? First book advice: If you want to write a book, yeah, I, I did a I did a free webinar um, called "Everything I Know About Getting Published." Just Google John Gordon, "Everything I Know About Getting Published." And you can listen to that on all the advice I give on, uh, on publishing and writing and so forth. I did it because a lot of people asked, so I wanted to make it available. But we're going to do it again more. I'm going to do another one, uh, an updated one, pretty soon here for, uh, for more people but with all the new stuff going on right now. What would you uh, say someone uh, facing se se severe depression and committing suicide? It's a very deep issue. I would say you really got to seek a counselor. You know, and I even say that in my book, The Garden, like my book is not meant to be a substitute for working with a counselor and really seeing someone who's an expert in mental health. I do not consider myself an expert in mental health, although mental health experts read my books and they use them with their clients. I know I'm not an expert. I don't claim to be. So I would, I would say definitely see a counselor and really talk about it. But help that person understand that those suicidal thoughts are not coming from them because they would never choose them. That is very freeing. And, uh, and once they understand that, they'll have less shame about it, and then they can move towards healing. 
so often we think our mind needs fixing when our soul really needs healing. Come to think of that. How do you push through the ceiling to get to the next level? Everything we talked about today. Everything we talked about. Trust, belief, optimism. And it may not happen right away. That's the thing. How do we push to the next level? Well, maybe, maybe you're in a plateau right now. That's going to last another couple of years. You keep working and working and working. It doesn't mean you're not going to the next level. It just means it hasn't happened yet. So often we want you know life to be like FedEx and deliver overnight, but that's not how the way it works. And so it's going to take time. It, it, the Energy Bus became a bestseller five years after it came out. It took five years. And so it doesn't happen overnight. I was grinding, working away, speaking everywhere and anywhere. Looking back, it prepared me. It grew me. It made me a better speaker to go everywhere and anywhere. It really made my heart uh, pure. Like I was doing it for the right reasons. Not for the money, but to do the work. Like It was a test. Are you really going to do this, John? Is this, is this your mission? Or is it really about the outcome? Or are you going to really get in the, in the trenches and serve? And all that grinding and hard work and staying in hotels that I wouldn't even let my dog stay in was part of the success that I have now. And so we often like we often think people are just successful automatically, but when you really know most people's stories, they have, they all have to overcome so much. And I I bet your top producers all had to overcome a lot to create their success. Oh, great question. I got I think I got one more minute. So, um, great question. Imposter syndrome. Yeah, we all struggle with that. That's you don't feel worthy. Who am I to share that? Who am I to be successful? Again, when you are trying to achieve something great, you will always get attacked in the place of your identity. You're always going to get attacked in the place of your identity, who you are, and ultimately what you want to achieve for you. So you have to understand that. I talk about that part, actually. So you're going to get attacked in the place of your identity. And then what you have to recognize is that you are working, you are here to do something great, and that you are getting attacked in the identity. But you are not what others, not you are saying about you. You are who you are on the inside. And when I first started speaking, I felt like that. Who is I up here to be talking to these people? Who am I up here to, to I remember I followed Colin Powell one time at an event, and I just felt so unworthy to be there. And I don't think I gave a great talk. And, you know, after that I said, on my walks of gratitude, I'd start saying, I am worthy. I am worthy. I am worthy to share this message. Not because I'm great, but because I'm here to make a difference. Because I'm here to serve others. See, your purpose, because you have a purpose, you have then an obligation to share it and help others if you have a purpose. So your purpose should be greater than your challenges, which allows you to actually overcome that. So my purpose, anytime I feel unworthy, is to share and to make a difference. I remember speaking at the Miami Heat, and um, Pat Riley was in the room. It was just NBA players in the locker room, and, and there's Pat Riley, like one of the legends in the NBA. And Pat Riley's sitting on my talk. I talk, talk about feeling unworthy at that moment. Like, hey, Pat, how you doing? And I, so then I had to do my thing. I did my thing, and you know, I had to focus on making a difference. It wasn't about Pat. Make a difference. Inspire those players. Encourage them. Speak life into them. Help them through their challenges. I did. And, you know, thankfully it went well. But uh, it was definitely an unworthy moment before you. Oh, can you recommend a podcast for a 16-year-old headed down the path of drug addiction? Yes. Um, yes. Uh, the one I did with Damon West and Chris Heron. Chris Heron is a former NBA player. Drug addiction ruined his life. Damon West is my co-author of The Coffee Bean. And Damon spent seven years in prison because he got addicted to meth. And he was a football star at North Texas as a quarterback. And he ruined his life, prison for seven years, because he was uh, he was burglarizing homes for the habit. And so he was supposed to do 65 years. He gets out of good behavior while waiting to go to, to the penitentiary, the federal penitentiary, the worst of the worst. He was um, talking to a guy. Mr. Jackson, he taught him about the coffee bean lesson. And Damon decided he was going to be a coffee bean and, and, and transform the environment he was in. For seven years, he transformed that environment. Gets out in seven years, comes out. Next thing you know, he wants to go speak to football teams to tell about his tale and to help them out of their wrong choices. He goes to Georgia, Alabama, Clemson, UCLA, all these programs. and starts speaking to everyone. And Dabo Sweeney told him about 
uh, told me about him because I followed him by a, a day. And he goes, hey, we just had this guy named Wesley, and he, he was incredible. And he talked about the coffee bean. And right then and there, I had a vision for this book called The Coffee Bean and realized that it's a story that's been told for a long time, but no one ever wrote a book on it. And so I knew we needed to share this message with others because Dabo said it was so powerful. And uh, Damon West, his story really helps, will really help kids. And he wrote his own book called The Change Agent, which is about his journey. And they're actually going to make it into a movie right now because it's so compelling about what happened and how he, how he survived prison and what he did and how he came out. And now the guy is just making a difference. He's being useful, knows the wrong he did. And he's really the, uh, the change man. So it's, it's a pretty, really cool story. But I, I think his story will help a lot of people. I had my son talk to him and help my son a lot. If you're in a workplace, uh, oh, yeah. All right, everyone. Well, I just want to say thank you so much. Thank you for allowing me to speak to y'all. Thank you for allowing me to sharing with you. You're all amazing. I can just tell. Hope to meet you in person one day. That would be uh, epic if I get the chance to do that in the future. And I just want to say that. And I want to finish with this. We have a choice every day. We can show up and look at our mistakes and our challenges and our our problems, or we can focus on our possibilities. Craftsmen are craftswomen. You know what they do? They take their challenges and they use it to create a masterpiece, to create a work of art. Because no material is perfect. They take the imperfect material and turn it into a masterpiece in a creation. And that's what our job is right now. The world is not perfect. And it has a lot of mistakes and a lot of challenges, and so do we. Thank God we have the ability and the power to transform our situation and to create masterpieces. The greatest masterpiece we can create is our life. And then a life that serves others is the greatest masterpiece of all. All right, thank you so much.